Well, you heard about folly ado a little bit ago, right? Have you ever heard the term folly, folly a professeur? <laughs> I, I actually got that once. And it was uh, because apparently I believed in, a, in a, what was actually a delusion rather than a real disease. So the fact that I bought into it means that I succumbed to the, uh, what is that term? A communicable delusion, I guess, or something. It finally infected you. Yeah, it finally, it finally got to me. So I was actually kind of happy. I didn't know there was a term like folia professor, but apparently there actually is. So what do you think? Shall we start with reality or unreality? Yeah, you want to go. Oh, no, let's start with unreality first. Uh, right, I mean, so really, it's, it all boils down to this. There are still plenty of physicians out there, healthcare providers, insurance companies, uh, who feel that uh, Morgellons is a purely psychiatric disorder, right? That anything else that happens is subsequent to the psychiatric disorder, as opposed to the other possibility, of course, is that even if there is some psychiatric component, it's because of the disease rather than the disease itself. So if it's not a purely psychiatric disorder, what would be the choices? Viruses, fungi, filarial worms, arthropods, bacteria? Well, the CDC it kind of, we have this whole unreality thing going on. And so uh, thank you for the good, the bad, and the ugly. That was, that was like a perfect segue for reality and unreality, I, I think. And, and also, I would like to thank the previous speaker for, for pointing out that it can be pronounced Morgellons or Morgellons, so that I felt a little vindicated from that. Thank you very much. So do you recall that when, prior, about the same time the CDC's uh, paper came out, on uh, unexplained dermopathy, there was a report that came out from an external peer review panel. And uh, it was called the Report of the External Peer Review of CCID's Unexplained Dermopathy UD Project. And at one point, what is shown there was the link for that. It was there in its entirety. And now, if you click on it, it comes up with the message, oops, we can't seem to find the page you were looking for. Please try our search or A to Z index, uh, which, which doesn't have it there uh, either. So I don't know. Is it a conspiracy that they took that off? Well, I found out that actually the external peer review panel's reports only stay up for a certain amount of time after a paper comes out. They stay up longer if a paper is never forthcoming. And so, you know, that was a, that was a pretty weird committee. So they, have you, have you heard the term stakeholder with regard to the CDC? So, so those of you who have an interest in Morgellons disease uh, are the stakeholders. And so I was selected as the stakeholders representative. They were desperate, they had to get someone and uh, they tried to be polite most of the time. But so, there was some confusion. That committee, that panel did not review the paper. The paper hadn't even been written yet. I don't even think they had started the paper at that point. It was purely to look at some in data points. You know, here's a, here's a micrograph, is that good data? Well, it's beautiful looking. Whether it has anything to do with Morgellons is unclear, but, it, you know, it was beautiful looking. So anyway, I want to read to you some excerpts about it because there is this feeling that everything was just completely negative that came out of that whole process. So this is the way it started. The CDC continues to receive reports of an unexplained skin condition in which patients report a range of dermatologic symptoms. And then it goes through and lists all of them, fibers, black specks, etc. In addition to dermatologic complaints, some sufferers also report fatigue, mental confusion, short-term memory loss, joint pain, and changes in vision. So now I want to take some pieces of that that 
often get lost in the, um, I don't know, in, in reading the entire thing. Many patients refer to this condition as Morgellons. However, for the purposes of this document, it will be called unexplained dermopathy. So notice this next part. At this time, the biomedical community does not know what causes unexplained dermopathy or if it is indeed a new condition. Scientists and physicians do not know if the people who report the condition have common risk factors or if there is a common cause for the symptoms. The factors associated with acquiring this condition are unknown and it is not known if unexplained dermopathy is communicable. Did, did you notice a lack of the, the word delusion in that introductory part? That sometimes gets lost in it, but the way, I mean, if you didn't know this was talking about Morgellons, couldn't this be almost any thing with some uh, unknown etiology? So the language chosen, I think, actually was, was uh, surprisingly uh, benign for the most part, considering that there was you know, a dermatologist who, at one point during the, um, the all-day panel meeting, which is really weird. It's almost like what you see on TV with like some Senate subcommittee. Here's this table set up with microphones and our names in front of it. And, and I, I made the comment about, well, early on before it even started, I had told the uh, contact of the CDC to let them know that I could get some patients who actually had Morgellons. And the dermatologist just practically jumped out of the seat. What do you mean actually had Morgellons? So we had a little bit of a discussion there. So with that sort of a, you know, pre-bias going into it, I think this is actually uh, written reasonably well. One part of what was done was what are the limitations of this study? And again, this wasn't the paper. This was just looking at the data that was collected, the design, and that sort of that thing. Okay, no universal, and so this is limitations. What are the study's limitations? There were quite a few of them that were listed, actually. So first they state that there's no universal agreement about how to define the condition or diagnostic tests. And then drop down to uh, this region right in here in the middle. Although the definition, okay, pay attention. Although the definition required fibers or particles to be coming out of their skin, no patient had a fire extruding from normal skin or visible within normal skin. If there are such patients, the study did not identify them. Notice the back up there, although the definition required it. So in other words, one of the limitations was they didn't have a single patient who met the requirements to even be in that study. Which is a little odd because normally the way studies are designed, that's one of the features is that you have to identify the population you want and then get that population. And up front, a limitation stated that nobody met the case definition that they were looking for. So right from the get-go, it was a little bit odd, I would say, as far as the paper goes. OK, more limitations. This was a descriptive case study with no control population. 104 patients, blah, 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 it goes down through it. Uh, with an unexplained dermopathy, specifically including fibers extruding from the skin. That was the description of the way it was supposed to be, but right before that, they pointed out that nobody met that inclusion criteria. More limitations. Participants were all selected from Northern California Kaiser Permanente database, excluding children under 13 and required to be English speaking. So it's not just a statement of fact they're making there. That actually was listed as one of the limitations to the CDC paper that eventually came from the study. There's more. Only one time point was studied, and this required illness within three months. And it's funny, I, people who've even read that paper didn't all catch that three-month part. Patients were excluded who, knew, who no longer had the condition, preventing a comparison of those self-resolving and those with persisting illness. The natural history of the condition remains unclear. Again, you see there's very little use of uh, delusions or psychiatric disorders. And there is a little bit in, in there at, at different places, but as far as the points that are so important about the limitations of the study, 
again, natural history, the condition remains in That could be anything that they were studying. There's more. The selection process for different aspects of the study may have progressively selected against patients who were busier, less mobile, or less concerned about their health. Factors leading to the progressive attrition were not studied. Because it was actually discussed hugely that considering how many they started with in the database, how few actually ended up participating. It was unlike any study that any of them had ever been involved in. But that wasn't looked at in the, uh, in the paper. And so it was one of the limitations. I could have come up with most of these limitations. It was actually the lead, uh, the lead facilitator who, who came up with all of them. So none of this is simply because I was there that they were being a little bit extra polite. Although in all honesty, they, they were being fairly polite. Okay, next section is, are there gaps of concern or a need for additional study? Well, one of the major gaps is in the, they were, the data was going to compare the frequency of Morgellons to the entire Northern California population. And so the panel said, estimated rates of the condition need to be adjusted for the size and distribution of the Kaiser Permanente population, rather than using the entire population base. Abnormal values such as thyroid stimulating hormone or uh, ESRs need to be reported to indicate the degree of abnormality which was not going to be, to be done. If a new study is to be begun, it would be important to address the question whether the dermopathy preceded the neuropsychiatric findings or vice versa. I, this is fairly powerful stuff, I think, and yet it, it's for some reason just never got out there and I didn't think anything of it uh, when, when the paper first came out. I was doing so much time with uh, damage control that uh, uh, I sort of didn't even pay attention to some of the things that I participated in. But that's the question that no dermatologist typically asks, and even some of the other primary care physicians who, who see patients don't. What findings can be communicated to the public, medical community, and stakeholder community? And the reason this question is asked is there's way more data than actually ever gets published. I mean, you know, the, you publish three micrographs, well, there might have been 300 of them that didn't get used, as well as some other data that, had, that some of it had to do with uh, questions off of the um, psychiatric profile, some of them off the initial screening, well, there's some things that probably people wouldn't want necessarily to be discussed. And so that's what's meant by what can be communicated. Okay, so we'll skip the first sentence. Consequently, persons enrolled in this study may not unequivocally meet all possible criteria for the condition popularly called Morgellons. There was no suggestion in the data collected that the fibers preceded the lesions, caused the lesions, or occurred in normal skin. And at, at that point, I pointed out that, uh, well, it wasn't even going to be in there at all, and then I pointed out that there was no discussion about that fact. And that's not an, an, a, a bad thing to ask, because in reality, I know of some people who have tons of fibers, but almost no lesions, and vice versa. Tons of lesions, but it's actually really hard to find, find the fibers. When one comes up, does it cause the other? I mean, so that part is actually unclear, and that's not a completely irrational thing to, to, to ask. What is the public health impact of this study? We're getting to the end of that report. This study could not provide a true prevalence rate but the condition appears to be uncommon. Thus far, there is no suggestion that the condition is transmitted person to person within family members from pets or related to travel or specific environmental exposures. Again, this could be anything they're talking about here. 
I mean, they're talking about it as though this is an actual condition that they're trying to understand. Now, this business of the, of the appears to be uncommon. For a person who has Morgellons and knows people who have Morgellons, it may seem not completely that rare. Uh, Nurse Casey, I think, mentioned what was a five to ten uh, inquiries per day about, uh, on average, uh, from new people contacting the foundation. So I'm, uh, mine's not quite so much. I've, I've uh, you know, faded off the radar a little bit. So I'm probably more like about five to ten a week, I would say. Once in a while, there'll be a spike, and then once in a while, a whole week will go by without uh, any, anyone um, emailing. It actually could be higher, but my voicemail is full, and I, 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 I just decided I would never go and unfill it. That way, you know, there would be other means of communication that would have to be utilized. Um, but even at that five to ten new cases per day, I mean, just to put that into a little bit of perspective by what they would refer to as common. So with influenza, if you just, it's obviously seasonal, but if you took it and just distributed it out over 12 months, there are about 6,600 people a day who die from it. So we're not counting how many people have it. We're talking the ones who die from it. So influenza. United States alone, 6,600. Oh, that was, into, that was the 27, 2017 year. And be, but still, that's, a, that's common, right? That's, that's a, a fairly big number. I mean, the, the actual number in, that have the influences is uh, way in the millions and millions. So at any rate, I don't think it was, you know, uh, unfair for them to have stated that it appears to be uncommon. And you notice they even used language that kind of covered the bases, but wasn't too over the top by saying appears to. It didn't say, you know, they could have made a statement, the condition is uncommon. That's a completely different tone of intent than appears to be uncommon. And, and trust me, I know how important how interpreting what's written is because uh, apparently a couple months ago I wrote something to the entire class of 2021 and, okay, maybe there was a tiny bit of sarcasm, but it was, you know, it was just in, it was, it was in, it was in jest and, oh, some of the students went, why has Weimar gone off the deep end? He's using that language and like, take it down a notch here. Uh, so, trying to put uh, intent is, intent in is always risky. Ah, here we go. What should the priorities be in the future? Physicians encountering patients who may have this condition should be encouraged to publish in peer-reviewed medical journal a description of a carefully documented case, photographs of fibers extruding from or present within normal intact skin, detailed histopathologic examination of biopsied skin specimens, and thorough analysis of the fibers will be especially helpful in clarifying several lingering questions. So that's what was actually said about the data that the CDC study uh, generated. So I now have, I've extended it on to three things. That there's three possibilities regarding Mor Morgellons disease here. Um, yeah, so first of all, Morgellons is a purely delusional disorder. And I put that in gray because we'll just go ahead and eliminate that. So there's only two other possibilities, really. Uh, that broadly, it's not delusional. There's a physical, physiologic, biologic, whatever way you want to think of it to cause. But then that can be broken down into two categories. The extraordinary causes, chemtrails, biological weapons, population thinning, the Illuminati, extraterrestrials, etc. Or Morgellons is caused by an environmental agent or a microorganism. Now, I feel the need to, to discuss this because uh, at least several times a month I get extensive emails, sometimes handwritten mail, and it was Janu late January, someone just showed up and uh, security had to track me down so that I could go talk to the person. And um, th they brought me some chemtrail samples. And I asked, I, I said, well, I would, 
I would be very interested in, in actually seeing chemtrail samples if they exist. How, how did you collect them? And he said, well, it just goes out every morning and they're all over the place. I said, yeah, I don't think that meets the criteria. So then the other possibility that if there's an environmental agent or, or microorganisms. Okay, so I want to say why specifically I can reject everything to do with these extraordinary propositions. First of all, science. I don't care what kind of science it is. It could be chemistry, it could be biology, biophysics. You have to have testable hypotheses. I mean, that is what science is all about. If you come up with an idea and you can't test it, it may be a great idea, it may even be true, but it's not science. Science has to have a testable hypothesis or multiple testable hypotheses. That's how it has worked for hundreds and hundreds of years and that won't be changing any time in the, the near future. Okay, as I sort of alluded with the chap that showed up, the origin of the samples. To be in any way credible, you have to be able to be absolutely certain that the samples you think they are really are that, that thing. And then there's the old chain of custody. Well, one uh, email from last fall, uh, this person didn't, didn't get the samples, but it was a, a buddy of his in Canada who made a trip to Washington, D.C., I think, and got the samples and sent it to him so that he could send it to me because they didn't want it, uh, somebody to know who was mailing the stuff. And so chain of custody is an issue there. You know, if, if uh, a physician or uh, a nurse practitioner sends me a sample and it comes along with, well, here is the patient, here's the information about the patient. Now, I have to de-identify it but at least I know that that was a good sample that, that came in and not just something that is being claimed to be, to be something. So at any rate, I am not just being snarky by rejecting these things. As a scientist, I can't possibly accept them because, as science because they are not science. Uh, I mean, now I might go looking for Bigfoot someday, that at least you know, I think has at least a slight possibility. Okay, so the bacterial evidence uh, for Morgellons has been uh, established, right? And this is another part that still, if based on the emails I get, is, is not completely well understood. Diseases are not typically caused by things in the same amount, in the same place, in the same quantity, in someone who doesn't have it and someone does. So for instance, I undoubtedly have some, you know, nasty things in my lungs, maybe some, even some, um, oh, let's see, what's, what's a really nasty thing in my lungs? But I don't have it. H. pylori, no, nah, I don't think I have H. pylori in my lungs. Oh, mycoplasma pneumoniae. Yeah, I've undoubtedly got some of those, but I am not sick from that. But if I were to suddenly get sick from something else, wipe out my immune system, or um, uh, develop a, a condition that doesn't allow me to, to mount as much of a, an event, that's why they call these things opportunistic. Right? They take advantage of the situation. So in that case, they are present in the sick and the not sick, but there are extenuating circumstances. Now, with Morgellons, right from the beginning, it's like, well, this is some pretty unusual stuff going on here. It's affecting the skin, it's affecting the central nervous system, it's affecting um, uh, internal organs. I mean, it's just the fatigue, there is just a huge amount going on with that. So I really was just thinking, it can't be something that's found in everybody. And I, I still, you know, maintain that to be the case, and I will show you why uh, in a minute. Now, in addition to the, um, 
the chemtrails and the Illuminati stuff, I can't say a week, but definitely there's not two weeks goes by that somebody doesn't bring up calembola or agrobacterium or a whole bunch of things that have, have been dealt with in the past. But here's the problem. I spent years of my early research trying to find something, and I found a lot of things that weren't there. And the reason I found those things that weren't there, or excuse me, didn't find those things because they aren't there, is because I was sort of, uh, have you ever heard of the expression, gone fishing? Yeah. I was fishing. I was throwing the line out there, hoping I might just accidentally get a bite. Well, in the process, so anybody that came up with any idea that it wasn't just totally impossible or not testable, I would actually go ahead and, and give it a go. And so there are a few things that have been elimin eliminated. Now, when I say eliminated, what I mean is eliminated as the causative agent. I'm not saying it doesn't play a part in health and even potentially if it gets out of control could trigger a worsening of the condition or something, but I, well, I'm talking causative agent here because that's what I was interested in. Well, we can forget about candida. It was in everybody. Not even, a, almost everybody. It was literally in every single sample that was uh, taken from skin swabs. And uh, skin and nail fungal infections, because I had a whole bunch of emails early on that, hey, if you look under the microscope, some of the hyphae from the uh, uh, toenail fungus looks a lot like Morgellons fibers. And I thought, well, I don't think so, but I'll, I'll give it a go. And so, uh, you know, 64% of those with Morgellons did have it, but so did 58% of the negative control population. Oddly enough, even people who did not have fingernail or toenail fungus, uh, some of them showed up positive. Uh, plant pathogens, jumping from plants to humans, a lot of emails about that. Well, 16% of the Morgellons community did have some of that on, based on skin swabs, and so did 12% of the population. Do you, do you remember reading anything about some protocols that said avoid mushrooms because mushrooms are related to Morgellons and you could possibly even get Morgellons from eating mushrooms? Oh, I remember that one very well. That's it. Well, that was a big old zero on that one. So eat your mushrooms. It's totally, it's totally fine. Uh, Ascomycotas, bread yeast, some of the things that uh, ergots like to uh, live on. 28 and 34%, nope. And then microsporidia, those are, are actually parasitic types of spores, not typically affecting humans. And that too was the big zero. And just notice off to the left there how many uh, species are, 19,000, 32,000, 64,000 species of Ascomycota and microsporidia, over a million and counting, it's probably up to about uh, 1.6 million now. The, the way I did the DNA analysis, I don't care if there's another two million that haven't been discovered, if they were there, I would have detected them for all of these. It doesn't have to be known ones because the unknowns share certain things in common at the genetic level. And uh, this was mouth cheek swabs because then I got the, well, you'll never find it on the skin, but if you go in the mouth, then you'll find it. And so I'm sure there might be a couple people in here who provided mouth swabs at, at one point or other, but I can't know that, of course, because they were de-identified. But anyway, um, you know, a little over half for both more gallons and control for candida. Uh, this one kind of was a little creepy that uh, skin and nail fungal um, uh, fungi were in the mouths of people. But about a third and 28%, that's not what's causing it. Uh, the Thidiomycetes, zero. Uh, mushrooms, once again, zero. So I guess even maybe they, eating mushrooms doesn't even leave any in your, uh, in your mouth for the cheek swabs. Uh, Ascomycota, 12, 14%, microsporidia. So the reason I have these broken down into these categories is because between them all, to look at the DNA for any one of them in each of these groups, 
That includes about 90% of all the fungi there are anywhere on the planet, including the unknown ones. Because uh, we as organisms in, in certain groupings tend to share certain genes. Well, the genes that I use to try and amplify the DNA uh, is what's called a housekeeping gene that is so, it's so important, it so rarely changes its DNA sequence that across literally uh, hundreds of millions of years, they're almost identical. And that's why it can be used to, so effectively to, to screen a vast amount of species um, uh, without having to do, you know, 10,000 experiments just to look at, at one single thing. So, in my mind, fungi are out. There's just, I, I, there's no way, plus just the fact that way back in the beginning, antibiotics, many people reported helped them at least transiently, even the short-term use of antibiotics. But antifungals by themselves, nobody ever reported they felt better. So right from the beginning, fungal infection did not seem like it, it made sense. So then there's all kinds of the parasitic and non-parasitic uh, organisms, uh, arthropods, worms, that sort of thing. And so uh, Columbula did a whole bunch of experiments. I think it probably, the, the two people who worked on it all together probably had uh, several hundred hours involved in just Columbula because it was so widespread held that that was uh, involved in it. Uh, Start off to the right on this one. So in environmental positive controls, so remember, I, I have to have a positive control or I, I might just think the experiment didn't work. I mean, if there's nothing, did it work or not? I don't know. So I have to have a positive control. Well, in this case, the positive control was actually uh, just uh, going up into uh, the woods in, uh, where I lived and getting some leaves together and uh, putting them in a glass of water and shaking it around and then using a few microliters of that water. And so four of the five different places I took it from had Columbula. So I knew that the, the experiment was actually working. 10 control population, I checked, nothing. 24 more gallon samples from, uh, I think it was about five different states with radically different climates from male and females. And anyway, 24 of them, it, it was zero. So, and this too, you know, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different columbal forms. And again, these, this DNA analysis, the PCR I did, uh, is, the, is actually the set of, I did it the way that the columbal people who are looking for new species do it. And so pretty much every week they find new species. And so if it were related to columbala in any way, uh, it was actually so sensitive once, I got a, a weak positive from um, uh, some other mite that was only, fairly distantly related. Scabies, scabies gone wild, scabies on steroids. Um, yeah, so that's one of the ones that I didn't have a positive control for, I will admit it. Um, but I was using uh, the primers that the scabies experts were using, so I had no reason to think it didn't work. It's just I couldn't find scabies in the environment, which kind of made me happy because I was check. Well, I, my daughter had goats, and so you know I went rummaging around through the goat fur, and and uh, the scabies can infect goats, pygmy goats. So uh, at any rate, but roundworms. Yeah, no problem, I guess, from dogs and coyotes and who knows what else. Uh, four of the nine samples did work that were for the positive environmental controls. Uh, 20 in the control population, 20 in the Morgellons, zero had any of the roundworms because roundworms were thought to be one of the candidates by a lot of people at one point. Flatworms, I don't think anybody really thought that except for a few very vocal people. And uh, I did find one environmental sample that had some flatworms, so I felt that the experiment worked. Zero out of 20, zero out of 30 uh, Morgellon samples. Cyanobacteria is a type of uh, uh, the bacteria that's a little different from the modern bacteria. I actually was surprised the four out of nine samples on my place had uh, um, cyanobacteria. 
I still don't know what that's about. I don't know. I just wasn't expecting it. Do you find it in certain places uh, associated with, with dampness and water? Uh, we have no ponds, not really any standing water. But at any rate, zero out of 38 more gallon samples and zero out of 20 negative control. But negative control just means people who did not feel that they had uh, more gallons disease. And so uh, then there's the bugs. And um, so mosquitoes, flies, Drosophila, that's the little fruit flies, uh, chiggers. I am horribly reactive to chigger bites. I mean, I, they can swell up the size of, of a quarter on me and leave scars from one single chigger bite. Yeah, I didn't have any trouble finding them in the environment because they always find me. Um, and again, scabies didn't have any of that. But looking up here uh, for the, um, uh, the flies, only one of them technically worked from the environment, but it did work very nicely. Didn't find it in any of the Morgellons or control samples. Now, how about one you would actually expect? Dust mites. Yep, found it in the environment, found it in Morgellon samples, found it in swabbing everyone's skin that I swabbed. Uh, Demodex, lots of species of those. Uh, eyelashes, other places, and sure enough, they were found in everywhere, uh, including the environment. That one, too, I wasn't necessarily expecting. I thought it would just be the negative control population that would be the positive control in this case. But just uh, actually uh, swabbing some dusty uh, furniture and tables in about three places, there was Demodex DNA in, in those places. Uh, ticks, because I had a few people had said that they thought it was actually ticks burrowing in uh, under the skin and moving around, leaving the fibers and stuff behind. And so, um, uh, there was not found in any of the samples. Nematodes. This one's actually important because, you know, the really tiny nematodes, the filarial worms, I mean, they are really tiny. They're on the size, size-wise, like some of the small Morgellons fibers. Uh, but they look completely different. They look like worms, basically, or living organisms. Uh, didn't find any Morgellon samples. Actually did find some in the negative control population and also in the uh, environment. The flatworms, tapeworms, that sort of thing, didn't find anywhere. Calimbola, uh, only in the environment. Archaea, yeah, that's this time in this set of experiments with different primers, found archaea in, in everywhere. And that's the uh, most primitive. In some ways, they look like they're precursors of bacteria, but in some ways, they're more sophisticated than bacteria, so go figure. Did not, did not find them. That was up there. That's the Drosophila melanogaster. So what about the bacteria that would be usual suspects, right? Staph. Staph aureus, that can cause some really nasty things to happen to a person's skin. So uh, in this case, what, what I did was just put the percent back to the percentage of samples. And so this was a whole bunch of negative controls and positive controls. The Morgellon samples were actual fibers. Tried to just uh, extract DNA from the fibers if there was DNA present there. And it turned out that there was. And uh, in this case, staph, uh, staph epidermidis, that's one of the, uh, well, usually found everywhere. Some of the Morgellons fibers did not have it. 100% of the negative control population did. So this actually became my all-time positive control for anything from the skin, because we found it every time, 100% of the time. And so anytime we did something with skin to see if the reaction was working, we did the, the staph. Uh, epidermidis to, to see. Staph aureus, not so much. There was actually a little bit more in the negative control population than the Morgellons population. E. coli, the other way around, tiny bit more in Morgellons versus control. Uh, cornobacteria, this is again sort of uh, uh, several species that are found just commonly in skin. Did you know you have more bacteria in your skin than you have brain cells? I mean, that's just one of those random pieces. You know, it's a random factoid that, that I think is kind of cool. 
Um, so, so really, I guess uh, we're almost more there as their feeding ground or something. I, I don't know. Uh, strep pyogenes, fortunately, zero across the board. Uh, Nasseria, a lot of nasty things associated with various kinds of Nasseria, uh, including STIs and uh, types of meningitis, 10 and 5, so it's good that that was low. Pseudomonas petita, that was someone specifically by, by species and subspecies that I was told to look for. And 2% yeah, did have it. I didn't find it in the negative control, but 2% is pretty low. Clostridium, again, glad that was zero. Nocardia, that was actually kind of interesting, even though it was only two, because that's uh, one of the ones that can actually make sort of a, has a filarial form, a filamentous form to it. Someday I might just for the fun of the, you know, when I'm older than I am now, go back and look at it. I have included a few slides here because I'm going to make sure that this presentation is made available. And, but bottom line is, everybody talks about uh, you know, transgenic stuff and agrobacterium. It's not the ag agrobacterium genomic DNA. It is this plasmid, a little circular DNA that is in some agrobacterium, not all of them, but some of them. That little plasma DNA, that small piece of circular DNA, is what you can cut open, splice genes into, and infect plants easily. But there have been a couple instances of going into something other than plants. So, uh, you know, lots of times when you see a genetically modified, a GMO type of, uh, you know, corn or wheat or whatever, it's probably they were using agrobacterium with that plasmid where they inserted in a, a piece of DNA. No more Gillen's patient had that plasmid in their agrobacterium. The negative control population had about the same amount of agrobacterium as found in the Morgellons population, and that population too did not have the normal, non-infected did not have any of the plasmid. It's pretty easy to find that plasmid. So uh, you've heard of crown gall or oak galls that appear on the, the tumors of oak trees and other, other trees. I just went out there and took a, a little knife and scraped an oak a big old tumor on my oak tree in my driveway and um, found the plasmid. Sure enough, it was there because that's what causes the tumors, right? It's not the normal agrobacterium, it's the ones that have this, it's called the TI plasmid. And so I know the experiment was working, I know I could amplify that DNA because just scraping the tree got me enough of it to be able to uh, amplify it. So all that stuff in my mind's eliminated People can choose to still think that it could be one of those. And again, I'm not saying what might not be associated. I'm simply saying the causative agent. So what do we think? Well, there's been a whole bunch of people, uh, Savely, Stricker, Middleveen, Maine, and others, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, other Borrelia subspecies you, you've heard about, Bartonella, H. pylori, Treponema denticola, uh, may, may all be in, involved. And I just wanted to show you this so you would understand when we say something is a particular species, so on the top line of all these were the, the CCA, CC here, TAG, um, that's, that uh, top line is the, um, the, uh, the standard, then you have whatever you've submitted there, sorry, the, the query. And what it does is it just compares them. It goes through the whole global database. And so when it comes up something like this, I don't say, well, this is kind of related to Bur Borrelia burgdorferi because PCR is inherently, has a little bit of an error rate, especially the, the type of conditions we were doing. We were using, a, it's called a base pair mismatch to try and wobble in case there were other close, close enough related species. So it's a little bit more error prone, but I mean, this is, this is not sort of like Borrelia burgdorferi, Th this is. Okay, so when we go through all those and, and other authors talk about these where they've identified it by, by DNA, it's this sort of thing. When it gets 97, eight, nine percent, it is that. It can't be something that's just closely related unless it's one of these housekeeping genes. And so, 
we haven't published this yet. These are the species we found. This is the distribution. Um, Bartonella was actually the one we found in the most, and then uh, H. pylori and Borrelia were, were pretty similar in dis distribution. Treponema denticola, it's normally found in the mouth. It's what's associated with uh, uh, buildup of uh, plaque, tartar, possibly uh, cavities too. So let me just say, if this is true, you shouldn't find all that in the skin of uh, unaffected population. And in fact, it was zero across the board. So these are samples that were collected from a pathology lab for other reasons. Looking for cancer, uh, someone who's having a bad acne that the normal treatments weren't working on, but anything but Morgellons, basically, these samples were taken from. And when we looked at all of them, not a one, as compared to you saw in that previous oops, uh, figure, May not be all of them, but some of them are all over the place in the Morgellons samples. And these eight samples, again, were from multiple different states, different locations. So, uh, and all seven of these did have the staph uh, uh, epidermidis present, so we know the reactions were actually working. We moved. Now, instead of being 30 minutes from work, I'm 55 minutes from work. But poor Mr. Darcy. Even at the new place, I start talking science, and he is upside down snoring in like two minutes or so. So in case, uh, yeah, so this is, this is an email. Uh, you know, I was wondering what I, what I was going to put for the last part of this here in the last couple minutes. And this email came three weeks ago, and I thought, oh, this is, man, what a perfect segue. This is a, this is a direct quote, except I did replace one word that I, I preferred not to use uh, here. Why aren't you spending more time? Insert the word there between more and time, and you might be able to figure out what uh, on Morgellons research. Can't you tell the bosses you don't want to waste time on things that aren't so important? Well, so I am not a full-time researcher. And, and it would be good from a research perspective if I was. But as, as of uh, August, I'm the Associate Dean for Curriculum at the Medical School. So the 500 students I am responsible for, I, I don't think are unimportant. Uh, the Office of Student Success reports uh, to me, and last summer, between about April and August, I spent 1,000 hours working one-on-one -on -one with students doing 10 board prep questions at a time, did over 2,000 questions in that time period. And students who need a little assistance, uh, I, I too think that they are fairly important. And then, uh, you know, I'm still a faculty member. I give 20 lectures a, a year. I am a course coordinator for two courses. One of them I think you actually might like, service learning and community engagement. The service learning is at two completely free clinics. The only requirement is a person can't have insurance. So uh, there aren't a lot of totally free clinics around. And in, in our part of Oklahoma, there are only two. And our students all first and second years, so all uh, about 260 of them go three times each to, to, to each of these clinics. And then there's this little entity in Tulsa called CAP Tulsa. You've heard of Head Start for helping under underprivileged children get, a, get started in, uh, earlier on. Well, they're, they're, uh, this is a local nonprofit. You've probably never even heard of it. But um, last year, they were listed as one of the top 10 nonprofits in the country. And that's including going against big ones like American Cancer Society, American Heart Association. Uh, they have a, a simple little mission, end poverty in Tulsa. I'm pretty happy to participate uh, in doing that because they don't just provide Head Start. They provide, they try and get every parent to have a medical home, a dental home for themselves, their children. And finally, you're going, why is he even telling us this? Oh, here it is. I supervise the research. Yeah, so I'm doing like some of the Morgellons, right? Or in some of those bad papers. Uh, put research in quote marks there. Because it's not bench research, it's literature research. 
So 34 medical students in the last three years. And the two so topics I had them research, chronic Lyme versus post-Lyme syndrome and Morgellons disease. Okay, so these were the conclusions they came to. Chronic Lyme is a real condition. Post-Lyme syndrome makes no sense. Now, these are second and third year medical students. And it took them a month to go through the literature, read reviews. They had to read some primary research papers. Those are the conditions they came, or the conclusions they came to. Also, Morgellons has a biological basis and is not a delusional disorder. Independently, we never talked. I gave them the assignment. I said, there are these three conditions. Lyme, chronic Lyme is controversial. There's chronic Lyme proponents and there's post-Lyme syndrome proponents. You sort through it and tell me what you think. The, this was 34 out of 34 came to these conclusions. Now, what's the big deal there? Well, drop down to the bottom. They are going to become 34 more doctors who are willing to treat patients with controversial diseases. So, so a little bit of my approach, and I know this is not good from an acute right now perspective, but at the med school and even before that when I was an undergraduate university, you know, there's the old, uh, give a, we'll, we'll make it less sexist, give a, a woman or a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. I actually view that uh, even though uh, you know, I will probably be long gone before some of them have a huge impact, these students every single year there's some of them that are going to have an impact and going to be treating people, who, who, a population who needs to be treated. So that's partly why I don't think it's, uh, it's unimportant. But uh, oh yeah, did you hear about this? We're opening a new campus, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. College of Osteopathic Medicine, Cherokee Nation. First partnership between a, a, a sovereign native tribe and a, a, a school, a medical school. Uh, it, it's taken up about 200 hours in the last three months of my time dealing with uh, this because you have to get accredited and little details like that. Well, some of you might actually remember Samantha Rice. She was a community college summer research student who worked in my lab and then came back the next year just as a volunteer because she sort of fell in love with Morgellons research. Then she went off to OSU Stillwater, the, as we call it the mothership, and um, is just about finishing her bachelor's of science degree. Well, guess what? She's going to be my grad student come August. She's been accepted into the program to do her PhD dissertation research uh, on the subject of Morgellons. So my hope is that, you know, some of the not... I, I, anyway, we'll be able to catch up, I, I hope. And so you notice what she posed. She sent this picture and with some ideas for research. We dream only as big as the sky, if you can't see that. And, and by the way, I got to tell you, uh, she, I, I admire her. She has two children, married, lives in Tulsa, and rides the bus every day to school, both directions. We call it Bob, the big orange bus. Uh, and it's about an hour and 10 minute ride each way. And she's been doing that for two and a half years, and uh, finishing up with uh, mostly A's and nothing lower than a B. So I'm very excited to have her. Well, these are some of the little ideas she came up with. Replicate previous results, get a publication, uh, do, do ticks in Oklahoma actually carry the bacteria associated with Morgellons? Do certain species of ticks carry different pathogens? Do the different stages of bacterial phenotype, that, you know, the spirochetal form, the, the uh, cyst form, all these different forms, do they play a role in the severity or variety of symptoms? Identify whether the symptoms correlate with specific bacterial combinations or bacterial phenotype. I'm going to have to get her to tone it down a notch here. Uh, this is probably about, I don't know, five students' worth of uh, work to do. Uh, obtain negative controls from humans and ticks, like legit negative controls that can be used for everything. And this, okay. 
What is the elephant in the room? The fibers. Where do they come from? So great, we think Borrelia and maybe Bartonella and, and H. pylori and all these things and probably some others are involved in Morgellons. Great. How exactly do they cause fibers to grow? Or black specks or sand-like granules or you go down the list of things. So, she proposes to try and grow the fibers in tissue cultured cells. Fibroblasts, who knows what other kind. Because in reality, that would be the proof. But, they can grow. They grow quickly. but you got to do it in culture. And well, there's two ways you can prove it. If you could infect an animal model, but that would be really hard to get through animal approval, I just want to say. Or you can replicate it in tissue culture. That done properly, every single argument there is on the planet about it would fall away. So, that would be sort of the ho holy grail to prove the reality of Morgellons disease, aka unexplained dermopathy. I thought I'd reverse it and put the unexplained dermopathy, see as the one in parentheses rather than... Uh, that, that actually won't, won't convince anyone because it's not in a human. It's not in a human or hu human cells. So I just thank you to President Shrum. Uh, she's also the dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, uh, the provost, senior associate dean. So uh, I have support all the way up. Every single person, we refer to it as the fourth floor because that's where you know, the seat of power is. Uh, they have all supported me. And even when the CDC paper came out, uh, they requested a meeting and wanted to hear what I thought about it. And afterwards, they said, OK. And I never heard anything after that. So they must have uh, agreed with my uh, um, you know, description of why I thought it was not the best of papers. And no, this didn't mean the end of the road for the research I was, I was doing. And of course, the Holman Foundation and, and Cindy Casey, whom I've known for how many years now? Oh, I don't know, a long time. Very long time. Very long time. And Charles, I remember him well. and. Uh, I, I still actually go out and uh, put a shot glass of uh, single malt scotch on uh, the day I remember him from. So thank you. I've got all the uh, references, but you don't need to see them.